Conservative momentum. Republicans moving to consolidate last November's political gains. Perspective from three Iowa Republican Party activists on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. I am a runner. I'm a coach. I'm a teacher. I'm a fan. I am a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa Communications Network, the ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Now celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa public television. This is the Friday, February 27th edition of Iowa Press. Here is Dean Borg. Potential presidential candidates are parading through Iowa, and the pace is only going to increase during coming weeks. At this stage, most are coming just to measure the temperature, political temperature, that is, and most aren't even admitting that. It's also worth noting that most of the temperature samplers are Republicans, even as the potential presidential prospects are buying tickets to Iowa in the dead of winter, Republicans in Congress and the Iowa State House are now flexing muscles from last November's general election gains. We're seeking insider perspective from Des Moines attorney Doug Gross, who has past experience on the governor's staff and as a gubernatorial candidate himself. And a man who writes about it all, Craig Robinson, who edits the IowaRepublican.com and Iowa National Republican Party committee man, Steve Scheffler. Gentlemen, welcome back to Iowa Press. Good to be with Very you. Nice. And across the Iowa Press table, women who also cover politics, Des Moines Register reporter Jennifer Jacobs and Radio Iowa's news director Kay Henderson. Now, let me say, too, that we're going to deviate from our normal format here, and we're going to make it a roundtable discussion, not question-and-answer format as such. So. I'll start off. So with, a food fight, in other words. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> and I'm ready for it. Okay. <laughs> Doug, uh, gas tax uh, yeah. sailed through the Iowa legislature this past week, and the governor signed it. It all happened within a few days. I know yeah. a lot of work had been done, but yeah. you've worked on the governor's staff in the past. Yeah. Were you surprised? And, and there's also some blowback now uh, from conservatives who say this was done too hastily and it was done without uh, conservative recognition. Is there going to be a political price to pay? I really don't think so. I thought this was frankly handled masterfully by the leadership and the governor, frankly. Uh, it's been 1989. I was chief of staff. That's how long ago it was since the last time we passed a gas tax in Iowa. And there's never been political repercussions associated with gas tax passes because people see it as a user fee. The roads are bad, we need to fix it. And in this case, you had the majority of both caucuses, both houses pass it, and the governor signed it right away. And we had a snowstorm the day that the governor signed <laughs> it, so it wasn't even on the front page. So I, I really don't see that. I think it was absolutely horrible. Um, yeah, I think that when you have, it's not that it, it rushed through the legislature. It's from, from passing a subcommittee to passing the House to, to being enacted into law this weekend. <laughs> less than 12 days. And so I, I think it's scary that we have a state government that can enact a tax in 12 days um, that doesn't give any time for people to adjust their budgets. Uh, and, you know, I think that there was a lot of, um, you know, I agree with Doug in the sense that there was a consensus that we needed to do something. But I also think there's been a huge bait and switch here where they talk about rural roads and bridges need, needing help and funds but <laughs> the same day it's signed into law, what are, what's the governor talking about? Expanding four lanes of, of Highway 20, expanding uh, Highway 30, expanding uh, Highway 61. That's not uh, fixing roads that are deteriorated 
or, or need <coughs> or but need the, funding. There, there That's a new there, construction. There wasn't one legislator, and I was there when Bob Ray did it in, in 81. I was his lobbyist, and I was there with Terry Branson, his chief of staff in 89. <laughs> There wasn't one legislator that lost their job because of voting for the gas tax, and there won't be this time either. Let me ask you this, Craig. There's a different strategy in Wisconsin. The governor up there, Scott Walker, doesn't want to raise the gas tax, so his idea instead is to borrow $1.3 billion to pay for their infrastructure. Do you think Iowa conservatives would prefer that strategy better? Well, I think that's it's, it's more difficult to do because we had a governor who borrowed uh, almost a billion dollars for other infrastructure needs uh, with Chet Culver and, and iJobs. And so... You know, I think that, that you know, look, I, I come from rural Iowa, and I understand that rural Iowa has, has needs, but, you know, my dad used to drive 90 miles a day to go to work in Davenport uh, from our little town of Goose Lake. Think of the, think of the tax increase uh, that they have to bear. Okay. Well, Steve, a fellow member of the State Central Committee, has said he is ashamed of this. What's the mood among the party leadership? Is this causing a rift among people? Well, I've been in several counties here since this whole tax increase was discussed, and I was actually in Mahaska County last night after it had passed. And there is a lot of concern among activists that uh, they don't want another tax increase. They weren't looking at this when they voted for Republicans in the fall. By the same token, I think that we have to keep our eye on the ball. As much as I don't like it, and I think most activists don't like it, I think that we have to understand that there's a bigger picture here and that Republicans and uh, activists have a duty to kind of keep heat on their state legislator to do the right thing. But to think that this is an overriding issue that should detract from us electing candidates in, in the coming years is just is ill-spoken. So I hate to see Republican leaders use derogatory terms, whether it's liar or hypocrite or whatever. I just don't think that's helpful. Okay. Well, who's been called a liar and who's been called a hypocrite? Well, I think there was a blog that referred to, you know, Republican legislators that uh, support the tax increase and use that category, and I just don't think that's helpful I, in the discussion. I think part of the problem is is that you had uh, you had state senators, Republican state senators, who were publicly opposed, and uh, up to even just the weekend before, well, and okay. then they cast a vote for it. And so the, the public a political looks at this and says, "What's going on? What, what do you see as the price?" In that sense, I think there could be a, a price, in, but in what way? Well, I think that I think this could hurt Republicans winning the majority in the Iowa Senate. Right, but let's think about this. Joni Ernst was. Uh, for it before she was against it. Who knows where she is on it now? It certainly didn't hurt her in the in the Republican primary for Senate, even though she voted for it in committee when she was in the Iowa Senate. But I think okay. I think let, I think I, mean, I think it's going to be a bigger issue associated with Scott Walker, uh, Jennifer. What you brought up, I, Iowans are anath. They they hate debt. And they certainly don't like debt with regard to roads. And so if people, if Republicans in Iowa, become aware that he's proposing something like that, it could be a problem. Let for me him. speak about another debt that's increasing, and that is a state prison at Fort Madison that is still empty, supposed to be occupied yeah. by this time, and the price tag on that to fix what needs to be done before it can open keeps going up. Yeah. So. There's a, a price that taxpayers are going to be paying there, but who's going to pay the political price on that? Doug, uh, it, it transcends well, two see, administrations. Chet Culver well, didn't get reelected. Well, so. Chet Culver. <laughs> he already did. It pay was a started price. under Chet Culver's administration, yeah. a Democrat. But Republican uh, Terry Branstad has had four years now. Where is the buck going to stop? Well, at the end of the day, it always stops with the governor. And obviously, Chet Culver did pay a price associated with the PLA that they used for that, a project labor agreement. They hired a contractor out of Chicago who hired, brought in a lot of workers from outside the state. And frankly, it was a disaster waiting to happen. I think at the end of the day, my concern is the taxpayers here because there are going to be lawsuits associated with this. And I think that's probably why the governor and the administration is not talking a lot about this, because there's going to be lawsuits associated with it. They can't really talk about it just yet. But at the end of the day, though, the governor went down and cut the ribbon. So the governor is going to be responsible for it. And so he needs to take charge of it and deal with it. Is there are going to be lawsuits? File them. He's a guy who's polling at 59 percent in yeah. Iowa. He's very popular. Well, I was just going to say, Jennifer, because that uh, goes into my question to you, Doug. Uh, uh, go back a year ago, when nearly a year ago, I think it was last April, you were on this program. Uh -huh. And at that time, the governor was running for re-election. <clears throat> we knew he was going to be a candidate. And you complimented the governor's management style at that time, but you said he delegates, and you like that style. Mm -hmm. But you also at that time said, because there were some things that were cropping up uh, in his campaign, uh, and the way that he administered that office, is that going to come back to haunt him as it relates to how this prison was administered? I really don't. I, I don't think so with regard to this prison, because this prison is a legacy project of Chet Culver. 
clearly the problems associated with, people are going to find out what they need to do is communicate about it. What the people are going to find out when they dig into it is the problems were caused by the way in which this was bid in the first place and managed associated with that bid. And that project labor agreement was a big, big part of the problem. And that's a legacy problem. What the governor will be held accountable for is can he clean it up? And mm -hmm. I think he will. Okay. How do you see it? You're reporting every day from the State House. What are you hearing up there as to where is the political price tag going to hang? Well, I think the interesting part about this is the House Speaker asked Bobby Kaufman, who's a state representative, who happens to be the son of the chairman of the Iowa Republican Party, to dig into this. And there is a great level of frustration among legislators that they can't find out more about what's going on there, mm -hmm. that maybe they were lied to this past week about whether the water pipes in a certain section of the new prison froze or, yeah. or didn't freeze. And so this is just going to be an issue that's going to percolate because legislators are getting frustrated. Mm -hmm because the agency people are not telling them things because there's a lawsuit being developed. And you don't want to, if you're the head of an agency, drop something. It's a bigger issue for something. Janet Phipps. Drop because something. Janet's going right. to be up for confirmation. Okay. They perceive that maybe Janet isn't telling them all. She needs to tell them. And I, I think the attorney general is the person really ought to be talked to because the AG is telling them mm -hmm. that you can't really talk about this mm -hmm. just now because we're going to file lawsuits. Let me quickly switch to presidential politics. Craig, uh, the Ag Summit, Bruce Rastetter is organizing, organizing that. Coming up now very soon. Um, what's the significance and who's coming to that and who isn't? Well, I, th I think most of the uh, Republican field is coming. I know uh, Governor uh, Jindal from Louisiana is not. Uh, Rand, uh, Senator Rand Paul is not, and I think Carly Fiorina is not, but the rest of the Republican field is largely there. Um, I think this is a significant event because for the first time uh, we're going to have, it's, it's not a, an event where candidates just come and give a speech on agriculture. This is a discussion. And, and I, think this will, I think this will be interesting because agriculture issues transcend a lot of different things that campaigns will, will talk about. And I think we'll learn a lot about these candidates. What do you make of Rand Paul not coming? He seems to stay away from multi-candidate <clears throat> events. I'm, sure, I'm told that he has a, a legitimate reason, a conflict, why he can't come. I Jennifer, do think it's an issue for both Jindal and uh, Rand Paul, who, haven't, who, who tend to miss these uh, big events. I think it's really problematic for Jindal, who needs those big stages. It's also uh, interesting to, that the Democrats aren't coming, except for Patty Judge, who's our former Ag Secretary. Do you have any idea why? Are they just, they, do they not trust Bruce Rastetter, or why would the Democrats not show up? Yeah, Bruce Rastetter, Rastetter is putting it on, and they see him as a big Republican giver and donor, and they're not going to participate in that. And frankly, Hillary doesn't want to show her face at this point yet anyway. But I don't, if I was one of those other Democrats running, I would show up. Why not? It's agriculture. You can, you can, you know, I don't think it's going to be a hostile uh, environment for them. I understand if they have concerns, but if I was going to want to challenge Hillary Clinton, if I was Governor O'Malley, if I was Bernie Sanders, I'd be there. Steve, is it is Rastetter, Bruce Rastetter, putting himself in the role of kingmaker in organizing this? No, I don't think so. I mean, I just think it's another, you know, we've had series of uh, forums and stuff, and I think it's just another angle. And so I think he has every right to do that, and I think uh, that it gives a new perspective and kind of digs into where they're at on these issues. So but I think it's a good thing. You yourself are hosting one. Correct. Uh, you don't <laughs> consider yourself to be uh, a kingmaker for the summit sure that you're does, hosting no. in April. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here, let's, let's face it. With 20 to 25 states holding their caucuses or primaries on March 1st, the first legal date that states can go beyond the four carve-out states, uh, that makes Iowa all the more important, and I think the more forums that we can have where these candidates are vetted are very, very helpful. But this, I think you raise an interesting question, because when the party, the national party, limited the number of debates you could have, mm -hmm. what occurred is you created an opportunity for, frankly, interest groups to create their own. And so I actually think that's a bad thing. I'd rather see the party host more of these sort of shows, so they are party sanctioned, so they're, they're not focused on one particular interest. For example, when they go to the Ag Summit, don't you think they're going to be asked about the RFS? Clearly, going renewable to be. fuel standards. Yeah, renewable Ethanol. fuel standards. It's going to be like a litmus test for candidates. But isn't, do we but, want to create a series of litmus tests as a party? Maybe as a state we do, but as a party, do we want to do that? And that's what's <clears> going to happen when we create all these interest groups that have these. So, forms. are you saying it gives Bruce Rastetter maybe an outsized influence for his pet Absolutely. issue? Absolutely, and the party is the one that should be having this influence because we're nominating a party candidate, not an interest group candidate. But the party has two major events where they're inviting candidates. They're doing their thing. Um, look, um, you might not like the RFS question, but I think it's an important question. 
uh, for Actually, Iowa. And like our, it for and, Iowa. Well, right. For our, mm -hmm. and, and so if, I think if you're running for president, I think you should be asked about it. I think there are questions regarding immigration that are different among the ag community mm -hmm. than maybe Republican activists. I think that's an interesting set of questions to ask candidates. Steve mentioned the straw poll. You were among the unanimous vote on the state central committee voting to have it despite all the criticism. Is it going to be just like it has been in the past or will you change this event um, so that it's more like CPAC where this, the straw poll is just sort of an afterthought rather than the main thing? Well, first of all, we have made those decisions, but you know, the one complaint I hear at the RNC more than anything is not so much that we have a straw poll. The concern and the perception is that it's a pay for play situation where we have a gun to the candidates' heads. So, I mean, I don't know and I hate to speculate uh, publicly how we're going to uh, oh, go make ahead, that differently. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that we want to make sure that every candidate feels welcome to come. And again, with all these states front loading on March 1st, I think it's important that we have these forums. And quite frankly, as a veteran of three campaigns, uh, when it, there was a straw poll, I think it gives a candidate the opportunity to to shore up their organization and then to see what they have to do yeah. between that time and the caucuses. So I think it's a very good thing. What's yeah. the local, what's the significance of the location? Oh, I just think that we want to make sure that we have a competitive bid and that whatever we do and whatever place we have is best for the party and our candidates. So it's nothing against Iowa State. We just want to make sure that we do the best thing for the party. Steve, give us a number of the 26 con 16 contenders. How many have you personally spoken with? You mean uh, privately or? Privately. I suppose about six or so. Okay, what about you, Doug? <clears throat> I've not accounted, probably a similar number. Did you initiate that conversation or have they come to you for advice? For, um, an example, the other day I'm, I'm having breakfast at the Embassy Suites and I see somebody buttering their toast across the way and it looked like Marco Rubio. So I said, walked over there, I said, are you Marco Rubio? Yeah, he sat down and had breakfast with me, okay? So that's, a, I guess it was both ways. Who else We're, have you spoken with, are you willing to say? Uh, I don't like to talk about that. <laughs> Can you rattle off the folks? Either, I guess, so. I, I, Steve, uh, it seems to me that these forums, though, maybe you're not considering it too early in the campaign, but it really is an opportunity on a very prominent pedestal to be making some gaffes. In fact, Scott Walker, this past week, might have done one as he uh, was commenting about uh, the union protests that he'd been handling in Wisconsin and made a comparison, if you will, to uh, the Islamic State and, uh, and being able to handle that. Is this a dangerous... No, I don't think so, because you know, a forum, unlike a debate, and this is where I dis respectfully disagree with Doug, I think forums give the opportunity for a candidate to basically say what they want to say. It's not a structured thing, you know, in the situation that we're going to have where they're basically asked some questions or where they're told what topics to discuss or whatever, and they can be themselves. But if we don't vet these candidates often here in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, there's very few other places that we can do that, and we need to see these people up close. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I, think, I think part of, though, what we're seeing uh, with the early, uh, you, you know, it's, it's January, February, we're seeing these candidates kind of make some errors. I think, I think they're rusty. Uh, I think that they're That's not... That's why we need for them, because but they that, need to the, go out and practice. Right, and, and, and so I think this is just natural in the sense that uh, they're not used to maybe talking about all of these issues. They're governors. They're what about not feuding, though? You've got, you've got some sniping now. So you had the former Texas governor, Rick Perry, snipe at, at Scott Walker and, and say it was inappropriate for him mm -hmm. to be comparing dealing with protesters to, to dealing with people who cut people's heads off. Well, you've got Chris Christie, who made a snipe at, at Jeb Bush, saying mm -hmm. if you want to have the guy who's elected by the Washington money, pick that guy. So the sniping is beginning. Are there consequences while Hillary Clinton sits off on the sidelines? The general election is not going to be you know, softball. They better right. get used mm -hmm. to it. And that, that's what this is all about. It's all about vetting of the yeah, candidate. Yeah, and, and, and Steve, I don't think we should have more debates. I didn't mean that. What I think we need to do is have more party-sponsored forums. And I think, yeah. I originally wasn't a, for the straw poll. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm glad we're having that straw poll. We have a really high-quality set of candidates. We need to test drive them. Exactly. Let me ask this, Gabe. Um, as you see campaigns setting up, not declaring officially, but they're, they're acquiring the mechanism and the... Uh, well, they're acquiring top talent. That's you right. Saw Jeb Bush. And who, who's acquiring top talent that you see? 
Well, I think this shows you who's most serious about running. Jeb Bush acquired David Kochel, who has a long history in campaigns in Iowa. Eric Wilson has been acquired by Scott Walker. Um, Wilson uh, was sort of the chief cook and bottle washer for the Huckabee organization mm -hmm. for a long time in 2007. He knows the lay of the land. Bachman, Those too. two people, and, and he worked for Bachman. Those two people have connections to Terry Branstad, as does Jeff Boyank, the former chief of staff, who's now working for Chris Christie. So uh, there have been some interesting... We have interesting... Steve Grubbs with Rand Paul yeah, very Grubbs, early. That was exactly. a great get for Rand Paul. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've and, got a lot of that have, going on. And the most interesting one for maybe a little <laughs> talking among ourselves is Chuck Laudner, who was a key aide to Je uh, Rick Santorum, uh, helped him get over the finish line in the last set of caucuses. He's now been hired by Donald Trump, and I'm wondering, Craig, what you're hearing <laughs> online about that hire. Well, Chuck's a friend of mine. I've worked for Chuck at the State yeah, Party yeah. before. Um, look, I think it tells you that Donald Trump wants to be taken seriously. Um, but I think his actions uh, will determine how seriously Iowans uh, take him. I think that, um, you know, Chuck is an interest. you know, when you talk about a, a Kochel and a, um, uh, you know, a guy like Jeff Boink and those people, those are foundational pieces that I think you can build campaigns on. Right, of. and Boink, we didn't mention, right. ran Branstad's right. 2002. Right, and, 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 and Laudner's a little different. I always describe him as kind of a, the cowboy off on the range on, on his own. And, and I think the campaigns are smart to kind of let Chuck be Chuck. And, um, you know, with Santorum, I used to call him a pitching coach. You know, it's just he's constantly in the air keeping his candidate focused on on what will work with Iowa. I, I'm curious to see how this works with Donald Trump. Donald Donald Trump is a lot different than Rick Santorum. Yeah, I'm afraid that eventually well, Chuck is going to hear this word, you're fired. <laughs> we'll see. It, it, you mentioned Rick Santorum. Sure. Running or not because of what's happening. Look, I, I, this, is a, this is a question that I'm, I'm posed by a lot of people a, a lot of times where, you know, Look, I've talked to Rick Santorum. He says he's running. But when you look at, you know, what, what does he have in place in Iowa, there's no... There's same been, thing's true there, about Huckabee, don't and, you think? And, and the same well, is true I mean, with Huckabee. Huckabee's people there's, called me, there's but no I they never followed up, and I've never heard from him again. Right, and I've not seen him around. I don't, and, is he going to run again, Steve? And so there's no, there's no infrastructure being built there. And so I think that leads to that question, which, you know, I, I think it's important for Huckabee and Santorum to, to make a hire uh, so that people... Get the signal that they're serious yeah, about yeah. this. Um, whoever wants to take a shot at this, but Joni Ernst hopes to recreate the Harkin steak fry, but for Republicans, can and she? And with pork. And with pork, <laughs> <laughs> can she do it? I mean, sure, she will. It'll be a fabulously successful. I think there's one yeah. risk though, is and the risk is is that you know you have David Polyansky who's running that event, who is also running Scott Walker's campaign, yeah. and so I think it. That, look, this is where politics comes into play, and so do I want to send a bunch of my people to an event and let David Polyansky know who they are? But I, they, they have to. I mean, look, at a lot of folks probably didn't want to go to Steve King's event, but you think that hurt Scott Walker? No. No, it, it helped right. him enormously because it gave him a form, it gave him some mm -hmm. exposure that he needed at the time. They're going to show up to all these events. I think that'll be a great event. Only got about 20 seconds left. You mentioned Steve King's event. Wildly successful? I thought it was very successful. Yeah, it promoted Steve, which is what Steve wanted, and promoted his issue, which I didn't want, but and nevertheless, it was placed, successful for him. Smartly <laughs> placed in, in late January. It was kind of the kickoff to, uh, to this cycle. Yeah. Well done. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Thank you very much for your views. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Kay. <laughs> and what's the significance, sir? You were listening your cup. I'm just tilting my cup to you. <laughs> Posting, all right. <laughs> and I will to you. <laughs> and we're going to be stepping away now for a couple of weeks. And we're going to be clearing time for Iowa Public Television's festival programming. We'll be back with another edition of Iowa Press the third weekend in March. Until then, I'm Dean Borg, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, I'm a veteran. I'm a builder. I'm a volunteer. I am a teacher. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, 
the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN supplies authorized users with dedicated internet and data connections to enhance their mission of protecting the citizens of Iowa with a private and secure statewide fiber optic network.